Good morning. This is the I Rebel Show on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I'm Sarah, and I'm here with Meredith. Hi, Meredith. Hi, Sarah. And we're going to talk about hero worship today. We've been thinking about this subject for a while now, and uh, we decided this is a good time to talk about it. Uh, we're going to try to square out some of our thoughts here. Um, so we've all experienced the feeling of discovering a writer, a musician, an artist, or a filmmaker, activist, teacher that seems to speak our language or articulates ideas that resonate deeply with us. You may find yourself seeking more of this person's work and devouring everything they produce, all along cheering, yes, someone makes sense, or wow, my mind has been expanded. Um, it can be a euphoric experience. It's interesting that I find myself and sometimes see other libertarians dismiss someone's public ideas or work based on a disagreement on one or two issues. Um, maybe it's important for libertarians more than others to evolve away from looking for libertarian heroes and more towards an open discussion. And that's what I see the Voluntary Virtues Network doing, uh, giving everyday libertarians a platform to discuss ideas and share easily with like-minded people. Have you had similar experiences, Meredith? I have, absolutely. And I think that last point is is pretty important. Um, so to to evolve away from looking for libertarian heroes and tor more toward an open discussion um, because that's sort of a core tenets of libertarianism itself or volunteerism uh, we should say and right. uh, you know not that I don't have heroes of my own I, I mean I guess I could call them heroes but I, I there are some liberty people who I really really love um, me you know, too but I still try and see them through a critical lens, and I don't always agree on, I mean, I don't think there's anybody that I always agree with. So, right. So maybe we should define hero worship before we go further talking about the different things we do like or don't like about, um, or how we view people that we do feel very strongly towards. Um, so hero, hero worship uh, can be the veneration of a hero, or the foolish or excessive adulation for an individual. Um, so yeah, it's definitely important to always be critical of anything that anybody is saying or putting out there for public digestion. Um, and I think it's easy to get caught up in somebody um, or have excessive adulation for somebody, um, you know, if you aren't really taking everything apart and thinking about it yourself and, and that personal responsibility that comes with that mm -hmm. as a libertarian especially. Right. Yeah, um, and this is uh, sort of timely, um, this topic that we're doing because of two things, uh, well, more than two things, but the two things that came come to my mind. The first one is, I'm sure you've all heard about this by now, about this thing with Stefan Molyneux that's happening. And we won't uh, go into it in great detail, um, just that there have been some issues lately and uh, that have forced people s to uh, sort of take sides or give their particular opinions on Stefan Molyneux personally, whether they like him, whether they don't, whether they... Uh, you know, think he's an important figure or, or don't. Um, but then uh, there was another person too, I don't know how many of you uh, listen to something called Red Ice Creations, but I've been listening to that. It's a radio show out of Sweden um, and I've been listening to it for so many years, so long. And he, uh, oh it's, it's run by a man named Heinrich Palmgren and um, he goes into so many different topics. He's got lots of spiritual topics and lots of, um, not the norm, like not, not Christian topics, but um, more like just plain, like Alan Watts kind of stuff. Um, or uh, Manly P. Hall, he does too. Or, or just um, strange archaeological finds he's into and uh, mysteries around the world, just all kinds of things. He's, he's interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people and he's a really great speaker and interviewer um, 
you know, probably the best I've ever seen. Uh, and then he got into anarchy for a while. Um, he interviewed Walter Block, which was fantastic. I was jumping for joy. And mm -hmm. he was really seeming to get it. And he started interviewing lots of different libertarian figures. And then he went somehow into nationalism. So I saw this progression from anarchy to, I, to borderline racism, honestly, mm. uh, anti-immigration, um, you know, just thinking this is social engineering, uh, they want to get rid of his uh, nationality or his, his cultural heritage, his nationality, um, and really started interviewing these nationalists that, you know, a lot of them don't sound like you know, some somebody I want, I agree with, or want to hear. And nationalism is really kind of the opposite of anarchy. And because of this, he um, has been sort of kicked off uh, certain venues that he used to be welcome on. So this is another person that a similar thing has happened with. And uh, and it's kind of it's sad. It's disappointing. I, I I listened to him for longer than I listened to Stefan Molyneux. It was you know a long time, and I really admired this guy. And I'm kind of still dealing with that. The disappointment. Yes. Yeah. I you know, and I really I kind of want him to get back on track, but I don't know him, and he's not. Mm -hmm. You know, I, he's he can do whatever he wants. He can think whatever he wants. It's just sad. Right. Yeah. And so do you think it's possible, or have you found yourself, I mean, still appreciating prior work or things that he's said or spoken about or interviews that he's done prior um, that are in line with libertarian thought and able to separate that at all? Like, I know that, um, you know, a lot of people, we know that people are critical of Ayn Rand and many of her ideas, but that isn't to say that everything that she ever said is completely worthless. Do you think there's a benefit to accepting some parts of something that somebody will say and discarding the things that don't work or don't, don't make critical sense to you? Well, absolutely. And and actually, if you don't, um, that's a logical fallacy. Uh, it's called the genetic fallacy, although I'm sure uh, there are different names for it because logical fallacies always have a billion different names. But um, <laughs> the genetic fallacy is basically saying, oh, I, whatever this statement is, is untrue because of who said it. Right. So like say, you know, we're, we're voluntarists. Say Karl Marx said something. Right. Anything. Right. And we would just dismiss it. Oh, that's Karl Marx. Well, that's the genetic fallacy that's that's dismissing something because of the origin where it comes from or it works the other way around too saying that um, something is right and true just because somebody you admire said it that's also the genetic fallacy uh, so either way um, you, you must look at arguments instead of or you know, I mean ideas and arguments Mm -hmm. instead of the person that it's coming from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so um, I wanted to talk about cult of personality, too. Um, and from Wikipedia, a cult of personality arises when an individual uses mass media, propaganda, or other methods to create an idealized and heroic public image, often through unquestioning flattery and praise. Cults of personality are usually associated with dictatorships. A cult of personality is similar to hero worship, except that it is established by mass media and propaganda. However, the term may be applied to an analogy to refer to adulation of religious or non-political leaders. While the cult of personality generally applies to the enhancement and promotion of a political or religious doctrine, it stands to reason that it is also asserted in everyday situations where popularity is used to advocate conformity to philosophies and lifestyle, even products and attitudes by the way of peer pressure and herd mentality. Mm -hmm. So that speaks to a lot of what I've, ex I, I've experienced when um, you will be critical of somebody um, that people do hold up as a hero. Um, I mean, certainly even like with a presidential candidate or... Um, I mean, Ayn Rand, right? I mean, 
I think I've I've uh, seen people exhibit that kind of like the peer pressure herd mentality, even criticizing her. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I mean we saw this with Barack Obama, uh, you know, big time. There was you know mm -hmm. she called the personality built up around him. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting um, that hero worship is just hero worship, but when the state gets involved, it's called cult of personality. So, um, <laughs> it, <laughs> which is funny because it seems to be like a different uh, that that happens with everything. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when when normal people do it, it's got one name, but when the state gets involved, we name it something else for some reason. I don't. Interesting. Do. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. But they definitely, uh, I, I think the state does need uh, the cult of personality to keep them going. It's just one of their tools, and it's a strong one uh, of, mm -hmm. of getting people on board and, and, and perpetuating their legitimacy. Um, Absolutely. So, which brings me to another point um, that I was thinking about. Is it possible that hero worship is just a symptom of a bigger problem um, of the infantilization of people as a whole that, you know, starts with compulsory schooling? Um, you know, you have you have 12 years of um, the state indoctrinating the kids into thinking that they need these these heroes or um, cults of personality. Mm -hmm. um, and then we grow up and you know you still see you see grown-ups that are even looking to like comic book heroes and uh, graphic novel heroes and um, I don't know is that like leftover um, you know, thinking from our from our younger years in in school, and does that have an effect on it? It seems like it it, it would. Um, it, you know, and this kind of we're we're always taken back to the school years, but it, it's so instrumental in the development of the human mind when when people are in school and this kind of thing is is pushed all the time and not just I mean and and I can see that being a symptom of the infantilization of uh, of people during their public school experience mm -hmm. um, I remember you know being in school and they actually had us writing about heroes choosing heroes trying to you know come up with them and write essays about them at, like every year <laughs> sure um, or even asking you who your hero is right and and it's another way of saying, well, uh, you know, here's a person. Aren't they awesome? You'll never be them, but you can love them. So, mm -hmm. you know, just st stay in your place. Be, you know, be your, you know, just your the machine. You know, the cog in the machine we need. And then you can just sort of, you, you know, live vicariously through these heroes that we have set up for you. Mm-hmm. And, and I think well. We'll tell you all about them too, <laughs> with the great man theory, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so the great man theory is the 19th century idea, according to which history can be largely explained by the impact of great men or heroes, highly influential individuals who, due to their either their personal charisma, intelligence, wisdom, or political skill, utilize their power in a way that has a decisive historical impact. The theory was popularized in the 1840s by Scottish writer Thomas Carlyle, and in the 1860s, Herbert Spencer formulated a counter-argument that has remained influential throughout the 20th century to the present. Spencer said that such great men are the products of their societies, and that their actions would be impossible without the social conditions built before their lifetimes. Um, so, we're all familiar with hearing about the great men, and uh, the great man theory through history, through our schooling. Uh, but I also think it's interesting to think about now um, that it's so much more collaborative of a world. And um, I don't know, I mean, what do you think about that existing still? I, I don't see that so much anymore. Although you still have this, um, like the presidential hero worship and if we just get the right person in office, then everything will work out. But um, reality is, is that 
life, pe the world is so much smaller because we have all this technology to bring us together and we can work together more in bigger yes. groups. I, I definitely think we're coming out of that via the internet, um, it, it, which is changing sort of everything in our world for the better. And but I do notice different great men still being recorded in history as as the people who have shaped the world when in fact they were only a small part of that and none of the rest of it is recorded. People like Steve Jobs or mm -hmm. Einstein or um, you know Maya Angelou was one that just came you know. We just heard a lot about through when she died. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of others. I can't, but Steve Jobs was the first one that came to my mind. Bill mm -hmm. Gates is another one, actually, if you're thinking about Steve Jobs. So yeah. there, we definitely, and those guys are in the history books, and uh, we definitely still have that and still have people waiting for these these great men to come along and make their lives better. And... Uh, you know, it does it abdicates personal responsibility? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm actually I I'm seeing both sides. I'm seeing I, I, I see it's still there, but just like with everything else, it's it's fading into the background. It's becoming less of a thing. Uh, you know, with with people, everyday people, empowered to yeah do what they want. And even with like the alternative media online. Um, you know, that not, this, not necessarily hero worship, but we can certainly seek out the people that we want to listen to um, and, and vet their information that they're giving us and not necessarily just have these big personalities on TV that we take our news from and listen and believe everything they say because they're so trustworthy. They, you know, they're in our living rooms every night. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's totally propaganda. <laughs> yeah, it's it. You know, you will be shaped by what we show you, and mm -hmm. I mean, it's similar to even before, before there was the there was the ability to print books, and uh, they had the Bible, but only the priests could read, and although the priests had Bibles, so they just told you what was in the Bible, and you just had to take their word for it because you didn't mm -hmm. have one. So this is, is a similar change to where people can say, actually, you know, this isn't true. And, you know, there are all these journalists who aren't getting paid by the establishment who actually just care mm -hmm. about giving the truth. And, and even, I mean, even if you're not a journalist, you can research stuff. It's all kind of right at your fingertips. I mean, not everything, but enough, you know. Right, so, right. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's fading away as well. Yeah. Awesome. And then we have military hero worship. We can't talk about hero worship without talking about the military. Yeah, it's kind of strange. Um, I is. was saying earlier, um, there seem to be two types of hero worship. One is worship of a particular profession, and the other is worship of a particular person. Um so like with military hero worship, it's like everyone in the military is awesome. You know, support our troops. Right. Or, you know, every astronaut is a hero for some reason. You know? Right, right. That's a... And you had another point about that too, right? Didn't you read something we were talking about? Like, oh, yeah. what does that say? Um, mm-hmm. Um, this was an interesting uh, point that somebody made uh, in that if we're venerating all these people as heroes, and it's not just the military or the or the astronauts or you know firefighters, it's just you know when you see somebody that saves a child from drowning or you see um, somebody who I, I don't know, I can't you know just, the teacher let's, huddling around the kids. Right. The storm, there, I think. I remember you mentioning that. There was an example of teachers, and preschool teachers in, in a storm. I can't remember. Probably like Hurricane Katrina, a big storm. And they were venerated as heroes because they ha were huddling with the children. But that's 
kind of weird because wouldn't anybody, first of all, that was their job. And second of all, if you're in a room full of preschoolers and a storm hits, what Mm -hmm. would anybody do? They would huddle with the children. So it's kind of like if these acts that we, we call heroic are, are actually heroic, well, that puts humanity at a lower standard, right? Couldn't you just call this being a human? I mean, people do mm-hmm. heroic things every day just as human beings. So that maybe we ought to update our our definition of the hero. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, or either that or just hold humanity to a higher standard than we already do. I mean, right. if you're in a, in a room full of preschoolers, I would expect you to you know, keep them safe, as safe as you possibly could, just because you're a human being and that's what they do, right? Right. So, you know. So that kind of makes me think, which I hadn't thought of before, I'm just throwing this at you here, but do we need heroes? I kind of don't think so. I mean, it just, it's sort of the picture is being painted that maybe no, you know, maybe we don't need heroes after all. Maybe we have people that we like and people Mm -hmm. that we, um, find helpful in whatever ways but the sort of status of hero you know possibly that's kind of bunk right and and maybe we need to take responsibility in the fact that we hold people up as a hero um, I read this article um, on this counseling site called hero worship and um, they said it's hero worships not really about the hero The same people who worship you will one day discard you the next, moving on to a new entity that does a better job, filling the role. If you had not been the chosen one, someone else would have been. This idea applies whether we're thinking in the metaphysical context of deities, the social context of fame, or the intimate context of a personal relationship. Um, So, for example, if you have ever had a romantic partner who began treating you as all-knowing, powerful, and more talented than everybody else, he or she will likely follow follow the same pattern in previous relationships, too, before they inevitably soured, just like yours did. Or think about the religionist who believes, loves, and worships his God until tragedy strikes, at which point adoration is simply replaced by cursing this God's name. Um, I mean, I think... That brings up some interesting points that maybe we have some responsibility in our in 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 worshiping the hero the, 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 that the individuals have that responsibility. Yeah, and I mean that's that's that and um, you know the the whole idea that we need to hold humanity up to a higher standard so that we stop calling everybody heroes. That actually puts the puts the responsibility squarely on people who are you know using this term hero and and turning people into heroes it's not the heroes themselves that are the problem it's 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 these it's people who allow themselves to be taken in by other people who who Mm -hmm. give up their personal responsibility and uh, see these you know see these people as great men when when they're just people like everyone else mm-hmm. so, which actually might help with uh, delegitimizing the state because if you mm-hmm. understand that there are no great men then you understand that the people who make up the states are just people like everyone else right. so they don't have any special powers they, they're not all-knowing right and and it's a manipulation too um, especially with the military hero worship where you're automatically a hero if you sign up for the military. Um, and it's really it's really bad, particularly bad, because if you think about it, um, if you sign up for that and you're, and you're sent off to fight a war, the people that are sending you to fight, they're not looking at you as a hero. They're looking at you as disposable. And if you happen to make it home partly intact, you're considered a hero by the general population. And you'll be told, you know, and even by the people that sent you, the, basically the actual people that make the decisions to start these wars, will say that you're a hero and hold you up. Like, 
uh, you know, you saw Obama do that in the um, his uh, State of the Nation speech. He had that that soldier that had come back mm -hmm. severely injured, and you know, there was that long applause of this this poor kid standing there just completely destroyed physically and who knows emotionally and you know it's uh, that's hero worship and um, is that what you want I mean that that was really disgusting to me personally yes. that's that that's what we're gonna worship as you know that, that that's a manipulation right yeah and it's actually um, this hero worship thing this great man theory the cult of personality uh, and especially I guess if we're talking about the state we're going to use the the term cult of personality or I mean you know hero worship would do too but that's what it's for is emotional manipulation and so if we can try and stay away from that just you know keep our feet on the ground and 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 know that that people are people the world over and uh, you know if there's somebody who does some super heroic thing sacrifices themselves you know to save a bunch of people let's say um, that normally wouldn't happen then maybe yeah we can call them a hero but you still have to know that that this term is used generally for manipulation and uh, you know and try and just stay out of it just think for yourself that's <laughs> mm -hmm. what you gotta do mm hmm that's true um, and so there's personal responsibility in that mm -hmm. um, that you have to try not to build heroes up um, and then they don't need to be torn down Right. Yes, because that happens as well, um, mm -hmm. just as often, actually. And uh, you know, well, like you were just saying that, uh, or the article said, is that uh, people who tend to do, you know, have worship heroes, will just toss them out, you know, as quickly as they drew them in. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's really about the people who are worshiping and not the people who are being worshipped. Right, right. Very interesting. Um, so I think that the important thing to remember is to try to separate ideas from people um, and people from ideas mm -hmm. and separate emotions um, from thinking and emotions from people. So if you're if you're feeling emotional about somebody, uh, then you're 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 not thinking critically about necessarily what they're saying or their message. You're feeling about them, and so you might be more inclined to hold them up as a hero and be unwilling to hear something that's not okay that they're saying or something that you probably wouldn't agree with if you were feeling emotional about it. Um, and same thing with critical thinking. So if you're thinking critically, you're not you're not feeling with your emotions. You're thinking. Um, and so I think we just need to try to remember that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's the key. Is is really you can really like someone and you can you know admire them, but you it, but it's it's important to um, to separate the person from their ideas and you know don't commit that genetic fallacy right? Um, right anybody can have a good idea and uh, and, and this the ideas are what we need to focus on and and not the people even even though you might like them That's... right right and it's okay to uh, debate or have a conversation about different ideas that have been put forth by different people Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean that you need to rush to just defend them because you really like them. Um, right. And I think that that's that can be really hard mm -hmm. to do. But that's you know that's the personal responsibility of freedom. Yeah. And not falling prey to tricks like you know um, the manipulation that hero worship can become mm -hmm. from both sides. Yep, absolutely. Involved.
Yeah, 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 it works both ways. Um, either you and and this is uh, what I was thinking about when you said separate emotions from thinking and emotions from people. This is a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. It's really hard. And like we were talking about the Stefan Molyneux thing, I have my own opinions just like everybody else does. And I realized that I need to, I'm not thinking about this clearly. I'm just not. Um, and I, I, because I'm emotionally invested. So, you know, I, I'm trying to separate that, but in this case, it's particularly difficult. But until I can, I, you know, I'm just going to stay neutral. I have to, because mm -hmm. I know, and this, at this time right now, uh, my emotions are what's doing the thinking for me. So, you know, mm -hmm. maybe I'll, I'll have an opinion down the line, but at this point, you know, m my emotions are talking for me. <laughs> uh, right. So maybe right. sometimes it's good to just wait until you can uh, not be emotional anymore. You know? Right. Nobody says that everybody has to come out on one side or the other of any particular right. thought or uh, group of thoughts. Mm hmm Instantly. I mean, take your time, right, and see how you feel, and and be open-minded. Um, we talked about that before in an earlier podcast about, you know, always being sort of skeptical, right, or taking things into consideration, even if they don't, you don't think you're going to agree with it. You can visit the idea. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, is there anything I, I can't think of anything else that I want to add right now? Um, no, I, I think those I think those two points really sort of punctuated mm -hmm. uh, what we wanted to say about it. Really, just you know, just keep an even keel. <laughs> That's about it. Right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So well, it's been great fleshing this out with you again, my good friend. Mm -hmm. I have always have fun. Yeah, so um, you can find us on the Voluntary Virtues Network where I revel uh, Saturdays. Um, and that's it. Everybody have a good weekend. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks, Sarah. Good night. Good night.